Hey, greetings everybody, Gleekon here again, as we are on chapter 22 of The Sundering, the third book in the War of the Ancients trilogy. This is our penultimate chapter, our penultimate episode of the entire War of the Ancients series, so we're very close to moving back on to the Chronicles. Um, okay, so uh, the world has been sundered, everything's ripped apart. And we're going to, I guess, just kind of find out how that affects maybe the world, probably our heroes. Stay a while and listen. Illidan dismounted, his rapt eyes surveying the thick forest for any threat. Of course, even had there been one, he had no doubt as to his ability to deal with it. The well might be gone, but he had learned enough from Ronin and the Burning Legion to make up for much of its loss. Besides, in a few minutes, even that consideration would be of no consequence. The sorcerer tied his mount to a tree. Jared Shadowsong and the others in charge of the host were busy arguing about mundane matters such as food and shelter. Illidan was more than happy to leave such petty things to others. He'd come to this place for a far more important reason, one that he felt outshone all others. He intended to salvage the lifeblood of the Night Elves. They were all naive, so Malfurion's twin had decided if they did not believe that the demons would someday return. Having tasted Kalimdor once, the Burning Legion would be eager for a second bite. Next time they would strike in a far more terrifying manner of that, he was certain. And so Illidan planned to be prepared for that coming invasion. The pristine lake buried deep atop Hygel's highest peak had survived the onslaught, undiscovered by either the defenders or the demons. A green, idyllic island lay at the very center. Illidan saw it as fate that he had been the one to come across the body of water first. It suited his desires perfectly. He touched the thick pouch at his waist. The precious contents within called to Illidan. Their siren song assured the sorcerer that he had made the right decision. His people would fall over themselves in their gratitude, and he would stand among them as one of their greatest heroes, possibly even more so than Malfurion. Malfurion. His twin was honored by all as if he alone had saved the world. The people gave Illidan some crumb of recognition, but many misunderstood what the sorcerer had attempted to do. Rumors swelled that he had gone to the demons to truly join them, and that only his brother had saved his soul from damnation. All Illidan's own efforts went unappreciated. His eyes, his glorious eyes, were only seen by the rest as a mark of his supposed pact with the Lord of the Legion. His so perfect brother spoke pretty words about him to the public, but that only made Malfurion look magna magnanimous. Even the antlers sprouting from his twin's forehead did not disgust the dainty night elves. They embraced it as a sign of divinity, as if Malfurion now stood as one of the demigods, the same demigods who had perished so easily in battle while Illidan had survived and thrived. It'll all change, though, he told himself not for the first time. They'll see what I've done, and thank me a thousand times over. Anticipation spreading across his face, the sorcerer opened the pouch and removed from it a vial identical to the one that Taronda had seen him use earlier. In fact, not only was the vial the same, but so were the contents. The Well of Eternity might be gone, but Illidan's storm rage had saved a small bit of it. It'll work. I know it'll work. He had felt the well's astonishing properties himself. Even so m minute an amount would be potent. The stopper shaped like Queen Ajara once more danced for him before popping off. Letting the stopper fall to the grass, the night elf held the open container over the lake. He poured the contents into the water. The lake shimmered where the drops of the well touched it. The water, originally a calm blue, suddenly glowed intensely where the drops hit. The change spread rapidly, first cutting across to the island, then around it. In but seconds, the entire lake had taken on a rich azure hue that no one could mistake as other than magic. To Illidan's heightened senses, the spectacle was even more breathtaking. He had expected a reproduction of the well, but this was fascinating in itself, yet it could still be so much more. He reached into the pouch and removed a second vial. This time, the sorcerer simply tore off the stopper and dumped the contents into the lake. As he did, the blue intensified further. Tendrils of raw energy began to play on the surface, and Illidan felt a wonderful radiance that he had not experienced since the well. His lips parted. He wanted to throw himself into the water, but managed to hold back. His hand slipped to the pouch. What would a third vial do? He undid the stopper and started to pour. What? By the... M 
What by the mother moon are you doing there? Illidan had been so caught up in his efforts that he had failed to notice the approach of others. He spun about the last vial still in his hand to face a party of mounted figures, Jared Shadowsong chief among them. Captain, the sorcerer began. One of the highborn glanced past Illidan. He's done something to the lake. It, the spellcaster's expression grew awed. It feels like the well. Illune preserve us, bellowed a noble next to Jared. He's resurrecting it. The commander dismounted. Illidan's storm rage ceases immediately. If not for your brother, I'd... My brother? An imperious fury arose, fueled by his nearness to the enchanted lake. Once more the power surged through him. He was capable of anything. Always, my precious brother! The others dismounted, following Jared's shadow song. Their wary expressions made Illidan tense. They wanted to keep him from the lake's power. He eyed the highborn, who would certainly attempt to usurp it for themselves. No! One of the nobles hesitated. By Elun, what sort of eyes does he have that glow beneath that veil? Illidan glared at the highborn. Their leader raised a hand in defense. Look out! Flames erupted around the other sorcerers. They screamed. Jared and the nobles charged him. Illidan sneered at the paltry threat and gestured. The ground beneath them exploded. Jared was tossed back. The lead noble, Black Forest, flew high in the air, finally striking a tree with a resounding crack. You stupid fools! You... His feet suddenly sank into the earth. As he looked down, tree branches wrapped around his body, pinning his legs together and his arms to his torso. Illidan tried to speak, but his mouth filled with leaves that adhered to his tongue. The sorcerer could not even concentrate, for a buzzing echoed in his ears, as if a thousand tiny insects nestled in them. Gasping, Illidan slumped to his knees. Through the buzzing, he vaguely sensed someone else approaching. The sorcerer knew without a doubt who it had to be. Oh, Illidan. Malfurion's voice cut perfectly through the buzzing. Illidan, why? The druid stared at the lake, its blazing blue color a clear sign of its contamination. No one could drink from it now. Like the well of eternity before it, it was now a fount of power, not life. Oh, Illidan, he repeated, eyeing his bound twin. Dathramar is still alive, reported to Rhonda, kneeling beside the highborn leader. One more also, but the others are dead, she shuddered. They were burned in their skins. Malfurion had intended to come alone, only the dragons and Krasis with him, but like the druid, Taronda had somehow sensed that Illidan was up to something. With several of her priestesses in tow, she had ridden after the dragons, but had arrived too late, as had Malfurion. Lord Black Forest is dead. The others, I think, can be saved, announced another priestess. My brother lives, managed Maev. She and Chandrath both attended to an unconscious Jared. He had bruises all over his face, and his armor was even more battered now. Dried blood caked several wounds, already healing thanks to the prayers of the priestesses. Jared's sister rose, and her countenance was one terrible to behold. She started for Illidan, at the same time drawing her weapon. No, Maev, Taronda commanded. He almost slew my brother. The high priestess met her, but failed. His fate is not yours to decide. Jared will do so. She glanced at Malfurion. Is that not so? He nodded sadly. It's his right, and I'll not argue it, the druid shook his head. So this is why he stayed so near the shore of the well. I didn't know that he had gathered more, Tyrande added apologetically. With a sudden hunch, Malfurion knelt near his brother. Illidan's breathing was even, but he stiffened when he sensed Malfurion near. The druid searched the pouch. At least four more vials. He would have turned this lake completely into another well. Can anything be done to change it back? Krasis had remained in the background, watching the events unfold. Now, however, the cowled mage muttered, No, nothing. What has been done cannot be undone. Alex Straza, however, added, We can do something to make of it a different force, one not as treacherous in nature as the well became. The mage's eyes momentarily widened. Ah, of course. Alfurion forced himself from his brother's side. And what's that? The three dragons glanced at one another, each nodding agreement. Alexstrasza turned back to the night elves. We are going to plant a tree. A tree? The druid looked to Krasis for some sort of clarification. But the mage, his own expression guarded, simply answered, Not a tree. The tree. 
they quickly turned it into a ceremony so as to lessen the impact of Illidan's misdeeds. The sorcerer was hidden away in order to prevent further trouble, and Jared's sister volunteered to guard him until the final fate could be decided. Jared, healed by Chandras and Maev, insisted that when the t when that time came, it would not only be it would be it would not be only his choice, but Malfurion's. Other than Krasis, Ronin, and the dragons, there were only night elves at the gathering. What the aspects intended was for their race, which had suffered so much and feared for its continuance. Nobles, highborn, and representatives of what had once been the lower castes assembled. The rest of the survivors gathered as they could down below, unable to see the spectacle, but aware that it would influence the course of their lives. Malfurion and the rest who had been invited journeyed to the island at the center of the lake. Despite Hygel's tremendous height, the top of the peak was fairly warm, perhaps even more so now that the lake had become touched by magic. It's beautiful, Tyrande whispered. Would that it was only that. Malfurion replied morosely. Illidan continued to be in his thoughts. He already had some suggestions as to what to do about his twin, and it pained the druid to imagine them being put into action. Yet Illidan clearly could not longer be trusted. He had slain others out of madness. His notion that the Night Elves needed a new well in order to protect themselves against some possible future attack by the Burning Legion was not sufficient reason for his heinous crimes. Although still creatures of the dark, despite having been forced to adapt to daylight battles, Jared had agreed with the dragons to assemble at noontime. Alexstrasza explained that the sun's zenith would be essential to what they planned, and the night elf was not about to argue with the giants. Despite the island's reasonable size, only tall grass covered it. At its center, the group positioned itself as requested by Alexstrasza. The dragons took up a prime location near what they said was the exact middle, leaving a small place open between them. The aspect of life began the ceremony. Kalimdor has suffered greatly, she rumbled, as those in the group nodded, Alexstrasza continued, and the Night Elves most of all. Your race was not completely innocent in all of this, but the trials and tribulations through which you have passed forgive that. There were a few uneasy glances toward the Highborn, but no one argued. The Red Dragon lowered her palm, and it nestled like an infant. A single seed similar in appearance to an acorn rested. Malfurion felt a tingle as he stared at it. Taken from Ganir, the mother tree, she explained. The druid recognized the home of the dead demigoddess Aviana. Ganir is no more, having perished with its mistress, but this seed survives. From it we shall raise a new tree. I wonder if that's the central tree to, um... Uh, blah, 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 to the Shadowlands in uh, the Night Bay land, Ardenweald. Also, you do get Guardian of Ganir if you master a Druid and Legion. And as Dormu dropped one paw to the ground and with a single swipe created a hole perfect for planting the seed. Alexstrasza gently placed the seed in it, then Isera pushed the dirt over the hole. The aspect of life gazed up at the sun. Then she and the two other dragons bent their heads low over the buried seed. I give strength and healthy life to the night elves, for so long as the tree stands, Alexstrasza proclaimed. From her a soft red glow flowed to the mound. At the same time the sunlight over the mound intensified, spreading all the way across the lake in every direction. Some of the night elves stirred, but all remained silent. A wonderful warmth spread over Malfurion, and he instinctively took to Rhonda's hand. She did not pull away, but rather tightened her grip. And from the mound there came movement, as if a tiny creature burrowed to the surface, the dirt pushed up and away. From the seed had sprouted a tiny sapling. It rose until the yard high, small branches sprouting. Lush green leaves burst from the branches, creating a delicate, delicate canopy. As Alexstrasza pulled back slightly, Nosdormu spoke, a slight hiss in his voice. Time will be on the night elves' side once again. I grant them continued immortality, forever a chance to learn, for as long as the tree stands. From him issued forth a golden bronze aura that joined with the sunlight as the red had. Flowing through the sapling, it sank into the mound. The tree grew again. As the onlookers gaped, it rose to more than twice the height of a night elf. Its foliage grew dense, green, and full of promise, Branches thickened, showing the health and strength of the tree. 
The roots began to come up above ground like many legs, a space almost large enough for several seated night elves formed underneath. Nosdormu nodded, then like his counterpart, withdrew. There remained only Isera. Eyes lidded the green leviathan studied the tree. Despite its swift growth, it was still dwarfed by the dragons. To the night elves who have lost their hopes, I give forth the ability to dream again. To dream, to imagine. For in that is the best hope of rebuilding, of recovering, of growing. She looked ready to do as the other aspects had, then paused. Her head swung toward Malfurion, and to those who follow the path of one held special by me and mine, I grant him and the other druids to come the path into the Emerald Dream, where even in their deepest sleep they may cross the world, learn from it, and draw upon its own strength to better guide Kalimdor's health and safety throughout the future. Malfurion swallowed, unable to otherwise respond. He felt the eyes of everyone upon him, but most of all felt Tyrande's proud touch. Isera looked again to the tree, and from her issued a green mist, like the two before her offering bound with the sunlight, then settled over the tree. As the last of it vanished into the soil, the assembled onlookers felt the ground shake. Malfurion led Tyrande back a few steps, and as if this was a cue, the rest followed suit. Even the dragons moved back, albeit not near as much as the tinier creatures and the tree grew. It grew twice its previous height, then twice that. It rose higher and higher into the heavens, until the druid felt certain that even those well below the peak could at least see the huge burgeoning canopy. So massive was the canopy that the entire region should have been bathed in shadow, but somehow the sunlight continued to focus on the area, even the lake. The roots also expanded, stretching taller and bending to best support the gigantic tree. They spread so high that now it seemed all of Lord Ravencrest's lost Blackrock hold could have fit underneath, and still the roots, the entire tree, grew. When it at last, when at last it ceased, even the dragons looked like no more than birds who could perch upon one of the branches and hide in the foliage. Here stands before you Nordrasil. The world tree is brought into existence, intoned the aspect of life. For as long as it stands, for as long as it is honored, the night elves will thrive. You may alter, you may follow different paths, but you will ever be an integral part of Kalimdor. <clears throat> Krasis suddenly stood behind Malfurion. In a whisper to the druid, he added, And the tree whose roots go deep will keep this lake as it is. The sun will always be a part of this well. The black waters will not ruin, will not run here, the sun well. Actually, that's what they want to call it. That's what the Blood Elves want. Maybe they call this one the Sun Well, yeah. Malfurion took this in much relief. He glanced down at Tyrande, who met his gaze with an expression that left his cheeks darkening. Before Man Malfurion realized what was happening, she kissed him. Whatever this long future our people have been promised holds, his childhood friend murmured, I wish to see it with you. He felt more blood rush to his cheeks. As I do with you, Tyrande. Malfurion kissed her back, but as he did, another's face intruded into his thoughts. There would be a period of rejoicing, of spreading the word concerning the Aspect's gifts to their people, but for Malfurion, those events suddenly mattered little. There was still Illidan to deal with. Tyrande pulled away, her mouth twisted into a frown. I know what it is that suddenly fills you with sorrow. What must be done must be done, Malfurion, but don't let his crime steal your heart away. He took strength from her words. I won't. I promise you I won't. Over her shoulder, Malfurion noticed Krasis and Ronan quietly retreating from the gathering. He glanced at the dragons and saw that Nosdormu was also missing. Just like that. Somehow the aspect had simply vanished without anyone noticing. There had to be a connection. Malfurion, what is it now? Come with me to Ronda while no one's looking. She did not argue. The two night elves followed after Krasis and the wizard. The voice echoed in Krasis' head. It has been delayed far too long. It must be done now. Was Dormu. Ronin. The human nodded. I heard him. They slipped out while the night elves were still babbling over the tree. Krasis would have liked to have spoken with Malfurion a little more, but the mage was eager to return home. 
Before the ceremony, Nosdormu had come to him. The aspect of time had caught Krasis alone. We owe you a debt, Coriel Straws. By we, Nosdormu did not just mean the other aspects in him. He re referred also to his various selves spread through time itself. Such was his unique nature. I did what had to be done, Ronin and Brox too. I also speak to the wizard at this very moment. The aspect had commented offhandedly. It was nothing for him to be in two places at the same time if he so desired. I tell him, as I tell you, that I will see to it that you reach home. Krasis had been very grateful. It had pained him to still be around an Alex Straza who did not know the fate to befall her and the other dragons. I am. Thank you. The bronze giant had given him a solemn look. I know what you hide from her. From us. It is my fate and curse to know such things and be unable myself to prevent them. Know that I now ask for forgiveness for the wrong that I will cause you future, but I must be what I am destined to be, as Malagos is. Malagos, Krasis had blurted, thinking of the egg secreted in the pocket dimension. Does Dormu, I know what you did. Give them over to me and I will pass them to Alex Straza. When Malagos is well enough, be presented with the young compared to all else that has happened it is a small change to the timeline and one of which i approve the blues will fly the skies again even though their numbers will not be great even after ten thousand years but better some than none Krasis had also wished to see his beloved queen once more, but it had been agreed that he might let slip something even she should not know. Now, though, as he and Ronan stood ready for the bronze dragon's reappearance, the mage regretted not having sought her out anyway. Ronan studied him. You could still run to her. I'd understand. The gaunt figure shook his head. We have twisted the future enough. What will be will be. <laughs> You're stronger than I am. No, Ronan. Krasis muttered with a shake of his head. Not in the are you prepared? Nosdormu suddenly asked. They turned to find the aspect waiting patiently. How long have you been there? snapped the cowled spellcaster. As long as I chose to be. Before going any other answer, Nosdormu spread his wings. Climb atop. I will take you to your proper period in the future. Ronan looked dubious. Just like that. When the last of the well devoured itself, Old gods were again sealed away. Their reach into the river of time vanished with it. The tears in the fabric of reality vanished. The way forward is now simple enough for me. From the ground, Ronan lifted up Brox's axe. What is that doing here? asked the aspect. Both spellcasters looked defiant. It comes with us, Krasis insisted, or we stay here and meddle more. Then by all means, bring it with. I hate dirt. <laughs> bring it with. No object. They mounted quickly, but as they did, Krasis spied a pair of forms hiding in the woods. He sensed immediately who they were. North Dormu. Yes, yes, the druid and the priestess. I've known all along. Step out and say your farewells. Then we must be gone. Although the aspect took their appearance in stride, Krasis felt far less comfortable. You two heard. We heard all, interjected Malfurion. Not that we understand all. The mage nodded. We could say little and still cannot say more. Just know this, the two of you. We shall meet again. People will survive, asked Aranda. The mage calculated his words before speaking. 
Yes, and the world would be the better for it. And with that, I say goodbye. Ronan raised Brox's axe, echoing Krasis's farewell. As Dormu stretched his wings again, the night elves immediately backed away. They raised hands toward the pair, but before they could, both the dragon and his riders simply vanished. Okay, so this chapter was the aftermath, and it did involve what happens with Illidan. He doesn't become demon form yet, but there's also a book, a novel later on that deals with, it's called Illidan, so I imagine in that one he transforms. So there's a lot more with his storyline, which is cool. It's a cool storyline. He's still clearly freaking crazy and insane and partially evil. Um, and it's looking like what I said is going to come to pass. Final bitty chapter at the end, dealing with them arriving back in the present. Okay, another episode in the Pipes 5x5. Five five. I look forward to seeing you guys for the next one, for a final chapter of the War of the Ancients trilogy. Thanks, as always, for listening. See you next time on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft.